Thank you so much for coming. Please uh, make yourself comfortable. Uh, if you haven't got a drink, you can grab drinks downstairs and uh, uh, enjoy while you're listening to the, to the sessions. So this is the fourth uh, Free Cities meetup that we've run. I think this is the biggest one we've had uh, so far looking around. And that's really encouraging because I think it shows that there's a lot of interest in this idea of alternative governance, which is what these meetups focus on. Um, so these meetups specifically are about what happens when you transfer power from large centralized nation states towards smaller self-governing zones, um, something that we call free cities. So we're going to talk a bit about that today. Uh, this session specifically has a topic, which is the territory of Hong Kong. So what we're going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce this idea of free cities and special economic zones. What is that to set the context for why we're here in this meetup today? And then I'm going to come to Hong Kong, giving a bit of introduction to what Hong Kong is, uh, for those of you who don't know, and then what Hong Kong implemented in terms of its policies, uh, particularly following the Second World War and what effect that had. And then we're going to come to a second talk by Ivan. Ivan is the CEO of Victoria Harbour Group, which is a Hong Kong-based property development company. And he's working on two exciting new projects in the UK, which draw on his experience in Hong Kong and the lessons he's learned uh, there. So I'm really excited to hear from, from Ivan uh, as well. So, um, and one other thing to say, my colleague Hinnick is, is sitting here. He also works for the Free Cities Foundation. Um, if you want to know anything about any of the projects that I'm going to just briefly skirt over in the presentation, he's a great person to talk to because he runs our research and he hosts our free communities directory. So he's got lots of detail on like the specifics of the projects that I'm going to mention. And uh, if you do feel like you want to take a next step and do some reading, we do have some uh, books here as well you can, you can buy. We've got uh, Free Private Cities by Titus Gable, another book called Entrepreneurial Communities. I'm going to show a slide uh, for a scene from somewhere called Morazan, and that's about the governance model that is applied there. So without further ado, I will come on to what uh, special economic zones are. So as I mentioned, we focus in these meetups on the trend of power moving from large centralized states to smaller places. And this is something that we don't actually hear a lot about in the news but it's happening worldwide on quite a large scale. So I want to show you a graph that illustrates that. This is a graph showing the number of special economic zones and how it's grown since the 1970s. The first modern special economic zone, so a zone that has special um, autonomy, special policies that mean that business can be done differently in the zone. This was established in 1959 in Shannon Island. And Within a decade, more were being built. It went up to 79. And then we had about 176 by 1985. But it's really in the late 1990s and the 2000s that this number really starts to take off. And so there are now 5,900 special economic zones worldwide. Not many people know that there are this many of them. This is what they look like on a map. <laughs> So as you can see, they're distributed everywhere. But it's kind of hard to tell because there's so many dots. But actually, a huge number are in East Asia and in China in particular. China is home to half of the special economic zones, um, which is kind of relevant to today's uh, talk because we're going to talk about um, Hong Kong and China as part of the discussion. I should say these, these zones are like in varying stages of development. They're not fully, some of them are just like, very early stage or just conceptual. Some of them are actually like fully autonomous um, cities with their own distinct legal system and governance model. Um, why is this important? Well, even though you might not be familiar with like the number and this trend that I've just shared, you're probably familiar with some places that have been greatly influenced by special economic zones. A good example is Dubai. Dubai in 2004, established the Dubai International Financial Center. And this was really important because what this did is allowed a special part of Dubai to have a different legal system to the rest of the territory. Uh, so 
Dubai made the decision that if they wanted to attract foreign businesses, particularly foreign finance companies, they were going to have to have a legal system that people could, could work with more easily and were more familiar with. So in the rest of Dubai, they have a Sharia law based system. But in this zone, they said you can operate according to English common law principles. And basically, it was massively successful. The reason why we all know Dubai today is this very successful Middle Eastern city that a lot of people from London are moving to is partly because they allowed autonomy for this zone and uh, introduced this new legal system. So special economic zones can have a very big impact on cities and on regions more broadly. Another one that uh, is particular interest to me is Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen is a city on the south coast of China, opposite Hong Kong, that we're going to talk about later. Um, and Shenzhen was like one of a handful of special economic zones that was set up in China following Mao's death. So Mao Zedong uh, was in charge during a very like um, tumultuous period in China's history where there was a very ideologically driven socialist government. And after he passed away, China didn't immediately move away from that system, but they did have leaders that were starting to uh, become more open to market mechanisms. And when you have a country of what was then just less than a billion people, um, changing the whole system for everyone at the same time is not something that you uh, necessarily want to do. So what they did is they allowed freedom to these special economic zones. And the one that was most successful was Shenzhen. It's a really interesting story. Um, there's a book I'd recommend called The Shenzhen Experiment by um, an author called Zhuan Du, which goes into it in, in detail. But basically, Shenzhen developed really quickly and, and um, convincingly during the 80s. And then Deng Xiaoping, who was the next big leader of China, uh, traveled to this city, saw what was happening in 1992, and basically gave the nod to the central government to say, look, Shenzhen is succeeding. We can roll out these market principles in the rest of the country. And uh, basically, Shenzhen, I think, played a huge role in transforming China from what was a heavily socialist system to now something that is um, still probably, some people would argue, not perfect, but it's got more of a mixed economy and people are uh, definitely better off there now than they, than they used to be by, by a long stretch. So, Shen, so Shenzhen, another example of a special economic zone, had what I would describe as a very positive impact on the development of uh, a very large number of people. Now, we at the Free Cities Foundation have a specific vision for what we think the future of special economic zones can be. So most of these zones are either not completely autonomous, like Shenzhen is more autonomous than most places, but it doesn't have um, like its own legal system, for example. Or they're very much catered to like business. So they're places that you can go and set up a company and have different rules, but they're not residential areas. So like they might look like this, for example. This is an industrial park in New Zealand, which is just for industry. And there'll be special rules here for industry. What we want to create is more zones so that people that have ideas like Deng Xiaoping had in China, or like the people that set up the Dubai International Financial Center had, can try them out and they can see whether they work. And if they do, then people will move there. If they don't, then uh, it's you know, an entrepreneurial risk that the investors are, are taking. So we think the world would be better if there were more of these zones, but we want them to be places that you can actually come and bring a family and live in and study and work and have a good quality of life. And some progress is being made. Like this is an example of an early zone that we're working with in Honduras called Ciudad Morazan. And as you can see, it's kind of a pretty basic industrial park sort of vibe at the moment. But they do have um, lots of community events that are starting to happen. There's a few dozen people living there. And it's becoming a really attractive place for people to move uh, because they're, they're offering a safe environment in a very unsafe part of the country. And uh, they're putting on these community activities. So we want to see this going upwards and larger in scale towards the city scale. If you want to find out more about Sierra Morazan or any other free cities aligned projects specifically, so something that is aligned to our ethos, which is 
you know, autonomy for zones and also an emphasis on upholding individual rights and freedoms, you can go to free-communities.org and you can look at some specific examples. So I now want to come on to the Hong Kong section of my talk, which is going to set the scene for what Ivan is going to talk about. Um, so firstly, what is Hong Kong? I'm not sure if everyone knows what Hong Kong is. So Hong Kong is a territory on the southern coast of China. It's located here, just at the mouth of the Pearl River Delta, which is one of the most industrialized and populous parts uh, of the world, actually. Uh, it was formerly a British con colony, and it's now a special administrative region of China. So it has uh, lots of uh, powers that would normally be associated with a country, but actually exist within a quote-unquote region. So what are some of these attributes that Hong Kong has that a normal city wouldn't have? Well, it has its own independent legal system, like the one I mentioned in Dubai. So the Hong Kong legal system is, in theory, completely separate from the Chinese legal system. Uh, China has a legal system that's based on a combination of socialist law and civil law combined, uh, whereas uh, Hong Kong has an English common law uh, type system, partly as a result of its uh, legacy as a British colony. But the point is there are Hong Kong judges and Hong Kong has its own, uh, own court system. Uh, so this is not dealt with by uh, another country. Second is immigration policies. So Hong Kong has a border and it can control who can come in and out. Uh, if you're traveling to Hong Kong from mainland China, you have to show uh, your ID card and there are certain restrictions about how long you can stay and things. Uh, but generally speaking, Hong Kong has used its immigration policies not to close itself off from the world, but to be a very open place uh, to travel to. Uh, if you look at, you know, countries like region, developed regions in which uh, you can easily travel to do business, Hong Kong ranks pretty highly. A lot of people, African traders, for example, come to Hong Kong uh, and they're able to travel there uh, without having to undergo lengthy visa procedures so Hong Kong has controlled its immigration and it's opted for a very open uh, policy, at least for you know, travel, tourism and, and business visits. Another thing Hong Kong has is independent fiscal powers. So it doesn't rely on subsidies from Britain or previously Britain, now, now China, um, other than perhaps some, some of the military expenditure and military defense. Most of the spending in Hong Kong is accounted for by taxes raised in Hong Kong, and then because they're, it's their own taxation, they can make their own spending decisions. Another country-like thing that Hong Kong has is, a, is its own currency, the Hong Kong dollar. Uh, this is a freely trading uh, international, international currency. It's not in any way pegged to the Chinese yuan. Um, it's, investors can, can buy and sell very easily out of the Hong Kong dollar, which is something that's not true with the Chinese renminbi. So how has Hong Kong actually historically used these powers? What policies has it put in place? I want to talk about the period from 1945 to 1997. Um, things have changed since then, and Ivan's going to touch on some of this in his talk. But I think the period 1945 to 1997 is pretty remarkable. Because when a region is given autonomy, or a country is given autonomy, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to introduce the kinds of policies that I might think are a good, a good thing. Uh, they could introduce a very sort of state-oriented model, and places have done that in the past many, many times. But what's um, special about Hong Kong is that uh, it used its powers to introduce like a very sort of market-driven system. And I want to, to kind of show you a few macro statistics that demonstrate just how like, limited the government interventions were in, in Hong Kong compared to other places. So this is just like the core figure. How much does the government spend as a proportion of the economy? Um, in Britain in the 19th century, when Britain was kind of industrializing very quickly, uh, going through the Industrial Revolution, became like the most powerful country in the world, Britain's spending was about around 15 to 10, maybe 10% as well. Um, Hong Kong basically used a similar sort of model to grow very quickly. Um, 
following the Second World War, Britain, France, um, Germany, America, they all went for a kind of higher spending uh, economic model. The figure in Britain was around 45% over that period, 1945 to 1997. So 45% of the entire economy was accounted for by uh, government spending in Britain, whereas it was only 15% in, in Hong Kong. So it was much less spending, much less intervention, much bigger role for the private sector. Similarly, the tax rates, top tax in Britain was 45% and 92% <coughs> in that period. And it was 15% pretty much consistently. Um, it's even lower just, just after the war. Um, but yes, it kind of topped out at 15% and actually remains that today, despite all of the changes. Another thing Hong Kong did was it didn't like nationalize all its industries. In during the Second World War, because countries like Britain had won this great victory, they thought, well, we've, we've just, the state has just done this great thing by winning militarily against, uh, against Germany and the Axis powers. So why not use the same strategy in other sectors of the economy? And there's obviously debate about how successful that was. A lot of these nationalizations were introduced and then they were taken away again because some would argue they weren't that successful. Um, that's a debate that I'm sure people have views on. But just to contrast with what Hong Kong did. So in Britain, we nationalized coal, civil aviation, haulage, railways, electricity, gas, healthcare, all in the late 1940s. Um, Hong Kong left all of these to the private sector. Um, the one thing that Hong Kong did do is they had a quite interventionist policy regarding housing, which I think is an interesting debate to have, like, has that been effective or not? Is that an area where Hong Kong would be better off without? But um, overall, the interventions in Hong Kong from the state from nationalizations were a lot lower. Another really important thing about Hong Kong was that it was a free port. It had completely free trade policies. There's a lot of stuff, or particularly when Donald Trump was president, there was a lot of stuff in the news about like countries having tariff wars, stopping others from uh, entering their market. And I was always viewing this thinking like, uh, like it's not the right way to look at it because in my view, the most effective strategy for making your own co economy strong is to just have no tariffs on anything because that means you can buy anything from world markets at global prices and you can make that as inputs to your industry and then you can sell to the global markets as well. You're not... Uh, putting your own business at a disadvantage. Um, and this was basically the policy Hong Kong took. It has had, since the 1940s, the lowest tariffs in the world, rounded to a percentage of the figure is zero. Um, Hong Kong has traded freely with the rest of the world. There was some debate in the, like, the 50s, at the start of the like, textile revolution in Hong Kong, when they were thinking about resisting US pressure uh, to put ta taxes on, because they were out-competing um, all these other textile industries in Britain, in, in Hong Kong. But they resisted that. They said, look, even if you put tariffs on us, we're not going to put tariffs on you because we want your inputs. So they bought all of the low price cotton, et cetera, and they were able to absolutely dominate the textiles industry uh, for a, a couple of decades. So free trade was another policy. Another thing they did was uh, balance budgets. Um, Hong Kong's government uh, brought in more in taxes than it spent 90% of the years between 1997 and, 1945 and 1997. Uh, does anyone want to guess how many Britain did during that time? It's 90% for Hong Kong. 5%. 5%, pretty close. It's t about 10%. Yeah. So Britain was spending more than it was making in taxes for 90% of the time, and Hong Kong was making more than it spent in taxes for 90% of the time. Very different views on fiscal policy. This is what Hong Kong did. Another thing that Hong Kong did, which is also in common with Britain, I had a very free uh, press uh, for, for this period and things are changing now. So that will come onto that. But Hong Kong had a very strong freedom of expression, developed a very vibrant media. Uh, people from mainland China would find out what's going on about mainland China through the Hong Kong media. And people across the region would read Hong Kong media, very well respected. Um, and you know, this, this 
created, this is good for business, this is good for communities, for becoming a vibrant, interesting place. So this is what Hong Kong did, and now I want to just talk about whether this was successful, how, whether these policies actually worked. Well, just to set the scene, Hong Kong was invaded by Japan in 1941 and occupied for four years, and the people didn't do very well, as you might expect, during this time. They were occupied by a hostile power. The economy was oriented towards a war effort, and... Uh, by 1945, when Britain um, was winning in the war and retook control of Hong Kong, uh, the wealth of the average Hong Konger was about a quarter of what it was in Britain. So there was a big gap. But because of these policies I've mentioned, Hong Kong was able to grow very rapidly. Um, it grew an average of 6.7% per year, compared to the figure was 2% in the UK. That may not sound like much, but when you consider the effect of compound interest, that's a huge amount. And you can see that within that period, so this is the period of, bear in mind, just two to three generations. Hong Kong went from being down here, and these are per capita, this is per person wealth. This is not just overall wealth. Um, Hong Kong went from being a quarter of as wealthy as Britain to being uh, wealthier, uh, being wealthier by quite a, quite, a, quite a, an amount, and actually over um, taking the US when you consider the purchasing power parity figure, which is a measure of how far your money goes when you spend it locally. So these are some more comparative like economic statistics. Per capita GDP, higher. Purchasing power GDP, a lot higher. Median income, and then this is the growth rate. Uh, it's 4% here because that's the figure to today. The growth in Hong Kong has slowed arguably could be due to the, some of the policies changes that we're going to come to. But uh, I think the economic picture is very convincing. This is what, so during that period, the average Hong Konger, when you adjust for, adjust for, adjust for inflation, became 10 times as wealthy. This is what 10 times as wealthy looks like on a city scale. This is 1961, this is 2014. So it was a huge development that Hong Kong went on. And this is even more like, in, impressive when you consider like, the resources of Hong Kong. Hong Kong was described by the first ever British governor of Hong Kong like, as a barren island with uh, not very much in the way of resources. Um, the only thing that Hong Kong really has in the way of natural resources is a very good natural harbor. But beyond that, there's not a huge amount of natural resource there. It's also roughly two thirds the size of London, so it's not massive for a territory that has 7.4 million people. And the other thing to consider about Hong Kong's history is that uh, a lot of people were arriving with literally nothing. Like, this is a video showing people traveling from mainland China that were desperately trying uh, to get to Hong Kong because of the system they had there. Um, and they were arriving with, with nothing, as you can see. Um, and that could potentially be a problem. Like, you know, we talk in this country about accommodating refugees and um, the kind of financial trade-offs involved with that. Hong Kong was able to accommodate uh, six and a half, seven million refugees or migrants, you could call them, um, within six decades. So that's economics. What about other metrics to measure how well how good life is in Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong's, so Britain's life expectancy in 1969 was, sorry, 1945, was 69 per person. It's increased greatly since then, which is a great thing, and it's now 81, which is pretty high by global standards, a leading number. Hong Kong had a life expectancy of 63 in 1945, and due to Whatever Hong Kong has done, it's been able to increase its number to 85. So it's now also a place where people live longer than its former colonial master. Um, and that figure is actually the highest in the world and remains the highest in the world to this day. Another important measure, child mortality. So how many children are dying by the age of, uh, before the age of five? Um, 
In Britain, we had a figure of 44 in 1951, and it's now about 3.6 today per thousand. Great, amazing improvement that we've had. Um, but Hong Kong is even more impressive again. They were at 90, and it's now at like 1.4. So they now have like a significantly lower child mortality rate. Um, and they spend, their state spending on healthcare is less than half of what we spend per person. Hong Kong um, has also become a very great, vibrant cultural place. You'll probably be familiar with the films of uh, Bruce Lee, um, Canto Pop, which is a popular style of music in East Asia, and like some people here are into it as well. Um, Hong Kong kind of overtook Guangzhou and, and Canton during the 50s and 60s, um, when China was un undergoing all this political turmoil, as being like the best place in the world to eat Cantonese-style food. So all of these other things as well create a picture of like what is a really interesting, vibrant place. And uh, I used to live in China. I lived there from 2010 to 2020 and visited Hong Kong around 20 times during that, during that stay. And uh, I always used to love going there. I find it one of the most fascinating places. Um, I love going back. And I can testify that, yeah, it's, it is a very interesting cultural place and a vibrant city. And I think... Um, that is, is in no small part due to the kind of system um, that they've introduced that's allowed society to, to flourish. So I want to highlight, before we come on to Ivan, I want to highlight three things that I think <coughs> Hong Kong teaches people that are interested in this idea of free cities. The first is that autonomy coupled with strong property rights, so that legal system I talked about that protects individual property rights, allows people to trade and exchange freely. Coupled with free trade policies, coupled with a limited form of government, where the government's not trying to intervene in every sector and control what people uh, work on and what they consume, this can be remarkably successful. So Hong Kong was able to grow its population by a factor of 10 between 1945 and today, and also it was able to grow its per capita population by a factor of 10. That's a remarkable thing. And I think more people should be studying how exactly Hong Kong did that and learning that lesson. The second thing that I think we should emphasize is the, is the humanitarian implications. Like for anyone that's familiar with what happened in China in the 1950s and 60s, you'll know that like being able to move to somewhere that protected you from the excesses of what was going on under that regime uh, you know, is, is, is an incredible thing. Like, people were able to escape a very oppressive auto authoritarian system. Uh, there were also people that were fleeing, like, the Vietnam War um, that, that ended up finding a new home in Hong Kong. Um, and not only do these people have a place where they could, you know, live and escape tyranny, but they were also able to become, on average, remarkably um, successful within a short period of time. Um, and this is important because the number of displaced people worldwide is growing. Uh, it's, official figures say there's about 100 million forcibly displaced people. And so my kind of takeaway is, look, we should be trying to learn from places like Hong Kong when we're establishing new free cities. Like free cities, I think, can be a place that are welcoming to new migrants that are probably not going to take a very like interventionist and subsidy focused approach to that but they're gonna be more open to saying like, if you want to come and, and work and not have to wait for two years to be reviewed by this and that body in a bureaucratic process, which is generally what happens here, then these could be a great place for you. So Hong Kong also just tells a powerful story about how successful this like more open policy can be of allowing people to, to move to your city. And then the third thing that I think we learned from Hong Kong is that Free systems can be successful, but that doesn't mean that they are going to last forever. Um, I am hopeful, and I mean, I have to be kind of optimistic. I hope that things will, people will, will realize how uh, good a thing they have in Hong Kong and how well the model has worked up until now. Uh, but it's definitely not um, something I take for granted. You know, the system in Hong Kong has started to change in recent years. Um, there is definitely much less of a 
uh, free press than there used to be. The, there have been some policies introduced that people are very, um, uh, feel very strongly about because of the way they impact the independence of the judiciary. The interventions of the government have gone up quite markedly. So that 15% figure I shared to you between 1945 and 1997, uh, the figure is now 28% in Hong Kong. So it's getting still low by global standards, but it's, it's increasing all the time. So free systems don't necessarily last forever. We have to fight for them. We have to argue for them. Um, and that's something that the Free Cities Foundation is, is, is hoping, is aiming to do. So those are my thoughts on Hong Kong. I'm now going to hand over to Ivan. Um, we're going to have a Q&A, but I'll save, the, I'll save the questions for after we've heard from Ivan, if that's all right. So um, I'll come to you in the Q&A session. Um, so I'll now hand over to Hong Kong, who's going to tell you more about... Um, Ivan, sorry, who's going to tell you more no. about <laughs> his experiences. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Oh, great. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> well, um, in fact, uh, this uh, was the photo we took in uh, Prague uh, last year, in October. Uh, it's about the Free Cities uh, Foundation annual conference. Uh, I was uh, very amazed. Uh, it was attended by over 300 people from 44 countries, uh, 34 countries, and I was uh, overwhelmingly inspired by the speakers, and I'm very grateful that I was one of the speakers. Um, from this conference, uh, there was one conclusion, uh, which was not made by me. It was made by a director, a documentary director, Kayla, who uh, has been shooting about our activity, the Victoria Harbour Group activities in the past two, three years. And uh, her conclusion after attending the conference, uh, she told me that, hey, Ivan, you know what? Uh, I wanted to, to tell you a long time ago that uh, the first time I saw you, uh, talk with you, I think uh, I thought that you are you are crazy because uh, what you are trying to do, but after attending this conference, uh, you are not crazy. There are more crazy people than you are uh, after attending this conference. So if you want to uh, know more crazy idea and crazy people, please attend the next uh, Free Cities Foundation annual conference, which will be held in Prague, it's right? in Prague again. Yeah, yeah. When? November first to third. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think uh, what, we, uh, what I want to tell you is uh, something uh, which uh, would not be allowed to be held if this discussion is being held in Hong Kong now. Uh, because uh, if I keep on talking this and uh, those topics we discuss in the conference in Prague, uh, most, of, uh, most likely I will be arrested of um, violating the national security law in Hong Kong, uh, and also the Article 23 of the Basic Law, which is also about the national security, but it is more uh, draconian um, because uh, they want to kind of uh, control us and uh, don't allow us to um, kind of uh, talk about uh, many things. So uh, basically, the um, national sec uh, after the imposition of the national security law onto Hong Kong, uh, there are much less freedom and um, and uh, while the national security law was uh, about uh, controlling our freedom, uh, and at the same time, now the uh, Article 23 is more serious, uh, more draconian, and uh, more restrictive. So I'm going to talk about these things, and uh, you can uh, have a little bit more idea. Um, in the past few years, there are a lot of Hong Kong people moving outside Hong Kong. Uh, the main reason is about the loss of freedom and also the full control by Beijing on Hong Kong. And, uh, uh, well, uh, talking about this, uh, the main cause of this was because uh, in the year of uh, 2019, the Hong Kong government wanted to uh, pass a law which is about uh, extraditing Hong Kong people to the mainland China for trial, uh, in accusing us of uh, violating whatever kind of uh, mainland law. And uh, as you may notice that, uh, almost all Hong Kong people have been to mainland China. And, and if they want to make up any excuse of us violating any mainland law in China, they can easily do it. So that was a very uh, real threat to us. Uh, and uh, after the imposition of the national security law onto Hong Kong, uh, it, uh, the threats become very real. Uh, 
Um, so a lot of Hong Kong people uh, vote by our feet and we left Hong Kong. And um, on the day of uh, the imposition of uh, national security law, which was uh, uh, July 1st, uh, 2020, and the next day the UK government uh, announced the BNO visa uh, for Hong Kong people to move to the UK. And uh, subsequently, the Canada, Australia, they open up their door to a lot of uh, young Hong Kong people. And uh, our estimation is that over the past few years, uh, we have already got more than 300,000 Hong Kong people left Hong Kong uh, to these countries. And um, so uh, basically, uh, for us coming into the UK, we feel very grateful for the chance because uh, it's a very generous scheme. Um, Hong Kong people who were born before 1997, uh, in Hong Kong are allowed to come here to work, to live, to study, or to do nothing. Um, meaning, that, meaning that we are qualified to come here. And the number, the estimated total number that are qualified to come here under such scheme is 3 million Hong Kong people. And uh, the scheme also allow us to bring out dependents, parents, and children. So in total, the estimated number can be as high as 5.3 million. But Calm down, uh, don't be scared. Uh, up to this moment, we have only 200,000 uh, Hong Kong people apply for the BNO visa. And uh, so uh, that's the picture that we have, the background. And uh, our journey started with uh, this um, uh, 2019. Uh, in anticipa uh, in anti uh, anticipation of the massive um, migration, emigration of Hong Kong people, um, I started the idea of uh, International Charter City with uh, a group of friends uh, like uh, this gentleman, Dr. Simon Shen, a uh, very uh, well-known in international relationship scholar, and also Samuel, who is sitting here with, uh, with us uh, tonight. And uh, we talked about uh, starting this uh, developing International Charter City in other countries so as to cater to the needs of Hong Kong people migrating to those countries. And, uh, uh, after that, uh, we uh, start to uh, set up uh, companies uh, and then look for lands and uh, look for lands uh, with planning and uh, we kind of uh, understand that the land in the UK is uh, much smaller uh, than in the US and uh, so we kind of uh, try to develop uh, this uh, new city and new communities, trying to carry on with the culture we have the language and also about the custom and also the core value that we have. And uh, as you might notice that uh, Hong Kong was being ruled by uh, the UK for 156 years. So after this such a long period, Hong Kong people has forced her to be a very unique ethnic group, meaning that uh, we, are, we, we hold values and practices which are very different from the mainland China. Uh, uh, basically, uh, from my point of view, I regarded Hong Kong people as a mix between East and West. Uh, we easily understand uh, and also being uh, easily understood by the both East and West. And at the same time, we, are, uh, we accept and also being accepted by both sides easily. So that's uh, where we are and uh, we try to develop these uh, new cities and new communities to try to carry on and, and also further develop our value and our culture language. And um, initially, in the beginning, we uh, talked to people like uh, the governor of uh, Colorado and also a middleman in Indonesia. But the first country that we formally engaged in the discussion about international charter city was uh, Republic of Ireland. Uh, because we think that Republic of Ireland is, uh, ha they have the lowest corporate tax uh, in the developed world. And also at the same time, they have all the uh, global um, IT companies there. Uh, they are English speaking, common law. And at the same time, they have the strategy of developing uh, their uh, cities outside Dublin uh, to expand their cities. Uh, and also to increase the population by one million in, within the next uh, two, three decades. So that all uh, take, uh, take the boxes. So we started uh, some discussion with the government official in the foreign affairs, and um, we gave them our proposal. Uh, but then uh, we were stuck because 
as a private company, we cannot lobby the government for the changing the immigration policy for Hong Kong people. So uh, how are we going to have enough uh, uh, Hong Kong people uh, live, uh, going to live in our new city or new community uh, if we are just relying on the investment schemes? So, um, uh, so uh, things uh, change completely, um, turn around comple completely. When uh, on the next day, the national security law, law was uh, imposed onto Hong Kong, the UK government announced uh, this BNO visa. So without, uh, without uh, it's an, almost like a no-brainer that uh, we started to shift our focus from Ireland to UK. And uh, we set up our company, we look for land with planning, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, we noticed that uh, it's different from the US, uh, that lands in, in the UK are much smaller, relatively smaller in scale. Most of them are just garden city, gar uh, garden village uh, with uh, a few thousand uh, home at most. And uh, so, um, after, uh, and also after the talking to some government official and councils, we changed our name from International Charter City to 21st Century New City. Uh, uh, this is to avoid uh, the uh, misunderstanding that we try to change the political system or the social system in our new city. Uh, we just try to develop six uh, uh, principles and values where we can uh, implement, uh, we want to implement in the new city. Um, so that's uh, where we, we have uh, gone through. And uh, the first project that we have approached was uh, uh, Otupu Park, which is a large project with uh, 8,500 new homes to be developed by the council uh, in Foxen and Hive in Kent. And that was the project we approached three years ago when we first came here. We met the council leader. Unfortunately, the council leader told us that they don't need money, they don't need any, anybody. So <laughs> we stole our discussion, but uh, luckily last year, early, uh, uh, early last, last year, there was a change in uh, council leadership. So the new uh, council leader uh, from the Green Party, uh, he welcomed the uh, uh, discussion again. So we engage in another discussion now, and, uh, but uh, my observation, <laughs> my conclusion is uh, discussion with councils here uh, is like a planning in the UK. It's lengthy, it's complicated, and it can be full of uncertainties. And uh, the second project that we have been uh, discussing um, with the landowner is uh, this uh, <clears throat> uh, more comprehensive development in Doncaster. Uh, it's a, um, <clears throat> a project with uh, several thousand new homes to be built, and uh, there are industrial area with logistics, with a lot of uh, job opportunities. And we think that this is uh, more like what we try to do because we don't want to just develop residential area. We also want to have some <clears throat> commercial area, business area, and also industrial so that uh, we can, people can uh, strike a balance between life and work. So uh, that's uh, uh, something that we are interested in. And uh, uh, interestingly, um, <coughs> Last year, uh, there were some resonance uh, at the more higher level um, um, about uh, this uh, UK 2070 commission. Um, it was a, uh, it, it's a commission led by the late uh, Lord Bob Kerslick and uh, his uh, advisor, Michael Hansen. And they invited us to uh, participate in the task force of a Hong Kong project in the uh, uh, in the T side, and uh, so after discussing with them and uh, introduce us to other team members, we um, we started to further work on our narrative and also further develop our concept. And we engage an international architectural firm, Benoit, to develop the idea, the concept, and the master plan. So we started with a eight square kilometer kind of uh, land in T side trying to develop this uh, idea of uh, leveraging on the free port status of uh, TSI uh, and also the TSI University. Uh, our aim is to develop a global 21st century free city, uh, meaning that uh, leveraging on the free port, but at the same time trying to develop a city where 
it, it's a, it is about future. Uh, it's not a future city, it's a city of the future, meaning that every uh, uh, economic and social activities in this city will be about the future of humanity and the future of the earth. Uh, so everyone uh, got involved in this city would be either inventor, innovator, or people who would, who would like to contribute themselves um, in the building a better future for the earth and also for the humanity. So um, I, uh, 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 finally, I would like to play this uh, short video about our uh, uh, concept uh, we have uh, worked out for the t -Sign. Uh This is uh, in the initial stage, and to this tonight, uh, Michael cannot attend because uh, he is still on holiday, Michael Hansen, but he said that, uh, yes, please share the, the, the concept with uh, the audience. So uh, yeah, uh, after this, uh, maybe I, uh, we can have more uh, question and answer and uh, exchange of ideas. Thank you. <laughs>